Okay, so today I will be continuing to talk about nil systems and uh, the goal again will be to sort of give you some useful general facts that might actually come in handy as you try proving things about multiple recurrence. Um, so the plan for today is a quick review of the main results that I presented in part one. And then the bulk of the discussion will be the second point here talking about equidistribution in nil manifolds. And I'll give a proof, or at least most of the details of a proof of Leon Green's theorem. Uh, and then I'll give some applications of these equidistribution results to problems about multiple recurrence. And I'm lying a little bit there. I'm actually going to use something more general than uh, Leon Green's theorem to get more interesting results. But we'll see that when it comes around. OK, so just a reminder from last time, here are all of the definitions of things that we'll need to talk about nil systems throughout. So a nil manifold is this quotient space of a locally compact single potent Lie group by a discrete co-compact subgroup. And I didn't write it out, but you know, the example to think about is maybe G is this space where you have ones along the diagonal and real entries in the upper triangle. And then your co-compact discrete subgroup could be something like this. So this was the Heisenberg group and is a useful example to think about for nil manifolds. OK, and then G acts on this space X. And there's a unique measure unique Borel probability measure that's preserved by all of these translations by G that we call the Haar measure. And then a nil system is if we just take translation by a specific element of our group and use the Haar measure. Okay. And why do we care about nil systems? Well. Some of the reason is for understanding multiple recurrence. So last time we saw two main theorems. So there's this decomposition theorem from Bergelson, Host, and Kra that any multi-correlation sequence, A n, so this integral of functions and iterates under T uh, can be decomposed as a sum of a nil sequence and a null sequence. Again, maybe I can write out uh, what I mean by null sequence. So this means if I look at this expression, it goes to zero. So we get some convergence to zero in density of this error term. And the other term is a nil sequence, meaning that C of n is, maybe I want to use some other, let's call it S, or maybe G. Is just evaluating a continuous function along an orbit in a uh, nil system. This is actually not quite true. So a uniform limit of things like this. So basic nil sequences. And so if you want to understand how these multi-correlation sequences behave, at least for some applications, depending on exactly what you want to do, you can reduce to understanding orbits 
in mill manifolds. Okay, and we have something similar for uh, multiple ergodic averages as well. So here's some summary of these the theorem from Host and Krah, and also proved by Ziegler. That if we have an ergodic invertible measure preserving system, then we have this sequence of factors Z sub K that are characteristic for linear averages. So if we're looking at uh, K plus one functions and we want to compute the multiple ergodic average, we can project to the factor ZK to compute the average. And this is helpful because of point two here that ZK has a very nice structure. It's an inverse limit of K step nil systems. So again, up to some approximation, if we want to study multiple ergodic averages, we can reduce this to understanding the corresponding averages on uh, nil manifolds. So I have a question. <clears throat> yeah. So this X and UT is just any old arbitrary ergodic invertible measure preserving system. Right. And but on the on the previous slide, I think X was specifically um, a nil a nil manifold. Is uh, that right? So here, no, this is also. I didn't write out here, but this should be okay. any ergodic invertible measure preserving system. Okay, cool. Thank you. Ethan, can I ask a question, please? Yeah. Uh, in the next one slide, yeah. Uh, here we are only taking the, you know, TIN, right? Just the. Yeah just the linear ones does can i replace it with like any other polynomials of or is that that is a very good question so the, I, that's what i'm one of the things i will talk about in a little bit um you can but then you have to adjust which factor you're looking at so if you have polynomials polynomials are good because we can use the van der Korpet trick to reduce them down to linear expressions but then it might be a very, if you have K polynomials, if their degrees are high, you may have a very long linear expression after you've applied I see. and appropriate a bunch of times. So it will be one of these nil factors, um, but it might be with a, the parameter might increase. Thanks. Yeah, so I'm gonna talk about, the, the more detailed discussion is gonna come with linear averages because that's where all of the key ideas are maybe not all of them, but many of the key ideas are, um, and it's a little bit easier to prove things there, uh, but I will give some applications with polynomial expressions because I think that's a very nice uh, general situation to look at. And of course you could also look at uh, maybe more general sequences that work well for a van der Korpet. So things like functions coming from Hardy fields, um, people have looked at expressions along primes, all the usual sort of modifications that we think about for multiple occurrence. Thank you. Okay, are there other questions? Okay, so now I kind of want to think about maybe this theorem here. So what this says, again, we have to some approximation, as I said before, we have this multiple ergodic average. If we want to know the behavior of this multiple ergodic average, we can look to a nil factor and then approximate by a k-step nil system. And if we want to know things about convergence, even where this limit converges in special situations, we want to understand these multiple ergodic averages in nil systems and the way to sort of get our hands on this is by understanding equidistribution on a nil manifold. And so I have this sort of motivating question here. So it's a little bit vague, but from that last theorem I showed you, this is a very natural question to ask. What can we say about 
these diagonal orbits, g to the n x, g to the 2 n x, up to g to the k n x in nil manifolds, where x is some point. Right, and so we're looking at this diagonal because this is going to be like this. Uh, Multiple, this is going to correspond to those multiple ergodic averages that we're looking at. And so sort of a review of some concepts for things we can say about orbits that we might care about. We say a sequence is uniformly distributed if the Cesaro average along, so if we take evaluate any continuous function along the sequence and take the Cesaro average it converges to the integral of the function. And then a stronger condition is that the, the sequence is well distributed if we have the correct limit for uh, any Fulner sequence. So that's what this uniform Cesaro average, uniform Cesaro limit is. Just an abbreviation for the limit over or the average over any sequence of longer and longer intervals. Okay, and so I'm going to first remind you or introduce to you a statement about equidistribution for compact abelian groups, since that's sort of the first level of uh, understanding nil systems. And then the main theorem today is going to be uh, a way of reducing this general question about equidistribution in nil systems to the abelian group situation. So here's a theorem if we're looking at abelian groups. We have all of these equivalent conditions. So we take an abelian group and some element of the group that we're going to use for a group rotation. And all of these statements are equivalent, that the orbit and alpha is dense in the group, is the same as saying it's uniformly distributed, is the same as saying it's well distributed. And then the fourth condition is uh, sort of a generalization of saying that alpha is irrational if we're thinking about rotations on a circle. So it's some condition in terms of characters on the group that none of the characters should uh, vanish on this point alpha. Okay, and let me just give a very quick sketch of why this is true. So for four implying three, this is essentially Weil's criterion. Uh, so you can approximate any continuous function by a linear combination of characters. So if you want to understand well distribution, you just need to check that you have the correct limits along characters. And then this condition that the character at alpha is not equal to one means that you can evaluate some geometric sum and show that you get convergence to zero as desired. Okay, and then Three implies two implies one is clearly true. These are, in general, well distribution is stronger than uniform distribution, is stronger than density. And so the only thing left to show is that one implies four, and this is also not so bad. So if you have some character that is equal to one at alpha, well, characters are homomorphisms, so it's also going to be equal to one along the entire orbit. But characters are also continuous, so it has to be equal to one on the orbit closure. And property one says the orbit closure is everything, so our character is just equal to one. So if you take any non-trivial character, you can't get it equal to one just because of this uh, statement here. Okay, so really what I want to illustrate here is for group rotations, Uniform distribution is a fairly straightforward thing to understand. We just need to, so the orbit is always 
well distributed in its orbit closure, and we can fully understand the orbit and the behavior of the orbit just by uh, looking at characters. And um, you know, this is something that's actually checkable in pretty much any case where we're looking at group rotations. Okay, so are there any questions on the situation for compact groups? Okay, so remember our main question, we wanna see, okay, we understand how orbits behave in compact groups. What about nil manifolds and nil systems? Nil systems seem like quite a bit more complicated as objects to study, um, but we're going to use our knowledge about compact groups to get our hands on them. So I need to start by sort of setting up some notation here so that I can state Leon Green's theorem. So I'm going to let x be a k-step nil manifold. And I'm and, sorry to interrupt, but I just want to yeah, check. Yeah. Is Leon Green one person, or yes. are they two? OK. I uh, made a mistake about that when I sent the email today, but yep. good to know for future records. Yes, this is one person is Leon Green. Um, yeah, OK, so what is the context? So we're taking a null manifold. Sorry, Ethan, um, are you yeah. using the full name in order for us not to confuse him with uh, Ben Green? So I honestly don't know. It's any everywhere I've seen. Uh, this seems to be standard to refer to it as Leon Green's theorem. Thank you. Um, so I'm sticking with that convention. Um, but yeah, I don't know who started that as the convention. Well, I guess Green is a fairly common last name. Yeah. There's also like, is this, this isn't the same green as the green talus theorem. Right. So this is, this is Leon Green's theorem was, uh, I think in the sixties. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's not, so maybe partially to avoid confusion with Ben Green, who, uh, has proved important results in this area. So yeah, that'd be reasonable. Okay, so let me get to this statement. So we have our setting, we're looking at a case step null manifold, and we're just gonna assume that G is a connected group. If you're dealing with something disconnected, you have to modify statements and be a little bit more careful. And then I'm going to note the lower central series as the sequence of uh, GNs that are just defined here, GN plus one, is the commutator subgroup from G and GN. And because G is nilpotent, this thing terminates at GK plus one. And we'll let gamma I just be the intersection of G sub I with gamma so that we can look at some quotients. And the goal is we want to understand equidistribution hopefully using the knowledge we have about equity distribution on compact abelian groups. And so we can project from our nil manifold to this abelianization. And then we're looking, so this object here is a compact abelian group. Okay, so it's compact because gamma was co-compact and it's an abelian group because G modded out by its commutator subgroup is always an abelian group. So just, I don't know how important this is, but just for my edification and like what order does it happen here? Do you mod out the um, commutator subgroup and then after that, mod out the discrete co-compact subgroup, or do you like multiply the discrete co-compact co subgroup by the, like what's the order of operations here? That's my question. Uh, I think those are the same. Okay. So this is uh, maybe, 
I, it's possible I'm wrong, but I, I think if you multiply G2 with gamma, consider that as a subgroup and mod out G by that subgroup. That's what I'm talking about. Or you can think about it as uh, G mod G2, and then you mod that out by gamma, that you maybe need to be careful there because gamma doesn't actually sit in G mod G2. OK. So it's not quite the sec. So I guess it's not quite G mod G2 then mod gamma because you need to maybe take some projection or intersection or something to make that make sense. Um, but these are maybe both reasonable ways to think about it. Okay, and so we're also going to think about this will be helpful uh, notation for when we get into the proof. We can think about a tower of extensions. So x1 is just a one point space. And then we have this tower of compact extensions up to the nil manifold x, where the ith level in the tower is just g mod gi gamma. And so this abelianization is the level x2. And then we can keep constructing additional compact extensions here. And we can even describe the fibers at each level of this extension as these groups gi mod gi plus one gamma i. So this tower should remind you maybe of the tower of nil factors. And in fact, if x is an ergodic nil system, then this picture here is the tower of nil factors for that system. So x1 is the trivial system. You take a compact extension. This abelianization x2 will be the Kronecker factor. And then you keep getting uh, compact extensions on that until you get up to your full nil manifold. OK, and now I can state the Green's theorem, which is going to have some similarities with what we saw in the compact group setting, and in fact, reduce equidistribution on nil manifolds to equidistribution on compact groups. So the following are equivalent for some g and x. The orbit is dense in the nil manifold. The same as saying it's, it's well distributed in the nil manifold. And the real key here is that that's the same as saying that the orbit is dense or well distributed when you project down to the abelianization. And then because the abelianization is abelian, we can use this character property that we had for compact groups. So most of the parts of this theorem come for free. The real content is that three implies two. Um, this also might be a trivial point, but why are you writing gn times pi of x instead of just pi of gn x? Uh, it doesn't make a difference. We can think about, so the group g acts on all of these spaces xi and commutes with pi because it's just pi is a factor map, if you want to think of it that, that way. So if I could put it inside or outside pi, it doesn't make a difference. OK, yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. And I guess the reason I want to write it outside is because I'm going to be thinking about the group acting at these different levels of the tower. OK, yeah, so as I said, by what we know about uh, compact dealing groups, and well, x2 is just a factor of x. Everything here follows easily, except that 3 implies 2. And so I'm going to try to prove that direction uh, following the proof technique of Perry. So I actually, I don't know what Leon Green's proof, Leon Green's proof looks like, um, but Perry has a nice proof from, I think, 1970 of this theorem. OK, so here's the setup. So we're going to suppose that property 3 holds. So we have this 
dense, well-distributed orbit and the abelianization. What that means is that the nil translation where we uh, translate by G is acting ergodically on X2. And X2 is a compact abelian group. And we can think about, so it's acting minimally, ergodically, uniquely ergodically. These are all the same statement for compact abelian groups. And we want to show property two, which is well distribution of a particular orbit in X. And because it's a particular orbit, what we want to show is not just ergodicity of T, but unique ergodicity. So that we can guarantee that we have well distribution for that at that point X. And the helpful thing here, which I'm going to leave as a lemma to come back to later, is that for nil systems, ergodicity and unique ergodicity are equivalent. So this is because of the nice structure of nil systems, as soon as you have ergodicity with respect to the Haar measure, there can't be any other invariant measures. So lemma one allows us to sort of not worry about this unique ergodic situation and just prove that we have ergodicity with respect to the Haar measure. And now we're going to use induction. So we're assuming that X2 is ergodic and we fully understand what happens for compact groups. And we're now inducting on the step of nil potency. So we know X2 is ergodic. We're gonna assume that we've shown that we can lift that ergodicity up to the step K minus one and now prove that we can lift it one more step up to uh, step k, which is the step of our nil manifold that we're actually interested in. So we'll assume that this system, uh, right, so that xk is ergodic, and we're trying to prove that xk plus 1 is ergodic. And I think, let me just make sure I actually wrote that correctly. Yeah, right, so x, x is equal to xk plus 1 xk is a k minus one step no manifold. And we want to prove now that xk plus one is also ergodic. So we're going to let f be some t invariant function and show that f is constant. Okay, so how do we do this? If we look at the group GK mod gamma K, this is going to act. So GK is, remember we've taken our lower central series and now we've stopped just short of the last part. So GK is the abelian group that we get and then uh, the next step we'd get the trivial group. And everything in GK, it's even better than abelian, it commutes with all of G because of how the lower central series is constructed. And so this compact group now acts on X and the action commutes with the action of G because the commutator group of G with GK is the end of this lower central series, it's the trivial group. And using this or auxiliary action, we can decompose L2 as a direct sum of T invariant eigenspaces for the action of GK. So anytime we have sort of commuting actions like this, we can get this nice decomposition of L2. And then we can just assume that F is sitting in one of these eigenspaces using you know, sort of standard arguments about linear combinations and so on. We can reduce to just assuming that F is one of these uh, eigenfunctions for the action of GK. 
So f of c times x is some character evaluated at c times f of x for any c coming from g sub k. OK, so is this set up so, OK so far? So now the goal is going to be showing that this character lambda is equal to 1. Well, that's part of the goal. So, so if we can show that lambda is equal to 1, then we can use the assumed uh, ergodicity that we have on the system xk to conclude that f has to be a constant function because that would give us, right? So if, if lambda is equal to one, then we have an invariant function for the action of gk, which is going to mean that we have uh, a constant function by the assumed ergodicity. And this is where some sort of clever arguments come in to understand this character. Okay. So just from star. All right. Well, where did you, did you, never mind. I was about to ask where you use the fact that the actions commute, but I think it's in the fact that the subspaces are T invariant. And, right. Yeah. Yeah. That we actually have a nice decomposition of the space. Thank you. Okay. So if we look at star, if you take absolute values of both sides, oh, sorry, this should be GK maybe. If you take absolute values of both sides, then you get f of cx is equal to, or absolute value of f of cx is equal to absolute value of f of x for every c in gk. But we're assuming that xk is ergodic, so that means that absolute value of f has to be constant. And so, as a sort of standard, we'll just assume that the absolute value is equal to 1. OK, and now we're going to look at this function. So we take some b from the group g sub k minus 1. So this is still coming from our lower central series, one step before we get to abelian. And we're just looking at this sort of uh, difference, finite difference here, where we take f of b times x times f of x conjugate. And the claim is that this is invariant under the action of GK and an eigenfunction for T. And I have written out the steps to show that it's an eigenfunction for T. The same steps will also show you that it's GK invariant. So let's look at this. OK. So if we evaluate delta BF at GX, just by definition, this is f of bgx over f of gx. And then if we want to switch the order of b and g, we multiply by a commutator. And then this commutator is going to be in, sorry, I have an i here. This should be a k, maybe. So b was in gk minus 1. So when we take a commutator with g, it lands in gk. And so we can pull off this character. And then uh, we assumed that f was t invariant. t was just translation by g. So we can pull off the g in the last step. And so uh, delta bf evaluated gx is just the character lambda of commutator b and g of the original function. So that shows that it's an eigenfunction for t. And if you took something from, if you replaced g with something in gk, then when you do this commutator of b with something from gk, you're going to get 1. And so um, the lambda term will not be there, and you just get invariance. OK, and this is really useful. So 
if lambda of b commutator with g is equal to 1, then this is giving us delta b of f is an invariant function for t. And so using, um, sorry, so it's gk invariant. So using ergodicity of, uh, no, that's what I meant. So yeah, so if that's equal to 1, then what we've shown is uh, some t invariance. And so uh, because of ergodicity of xk, this function has to be a constant function because delta b, this piece here implies uh, delta b f is measurable with respect to the factor xk. OK, and if this character is not equal to 1, then again using ergodicity on the factor xk, we can write the integral as the limit of some Chizarro averages. And now we're taking a limit along uh, some non trivial value. So t to the n is going to be like lambda of this commutator to the n. Since it's not equal to 1, you can express the geometric sum and show that this limit goes to 0. OK, and so what we're going to do is we're going to define a map that takes b to this integral of delta bf. And this map is continuous just because of how it's defined. We also know that when b is equal to 1, this integral, so lambda of 1, a commutator of 1 with g, is equal to 1. And so the integral is going to be equal to 1. In the case that lambda is equal to 1, we saw that uh, this function delta bf is constant, and it's a constant value somewhere sitting on the unit circle. So when we integrate, we're going to get some value on the unit circle. If lambda is not equal to 1, we get 0. And this is some disconnected set. We have either 0 or the circle. But we know that at least when b is equal to 1, we're getting a value 1 sitting in the circle. And we can conclude from this that these integrals lie in the circle for any b in the connected component of the identity. And using a lemma, it follows that it actually sits in the unit circle for every b in the group g k minus 1. And so the lemma is just that Anytime you take the commutator of two connected groups, you will get a new connected group. OK, so what does all of this do for us? We can now extend lambda to the full group G by this integral expression. And what we just showed above is that on gk minus 1, lambda takes values in the unit circle. And it's a homomorphism, just from the definition. So lambda at b1, b2 is equal to this ratio of these functions. And the string of equalities I've written down here holds for almost every x because uh, as we said, using ergodicity, delta b f has to be constant almost everywhere uh, by the induction hypothesis giving ergodicity of xk. 
And so this gives us some homomorphism property. So lambda actually extends uh, to a character on a larger group than what we started with. And we have some additional nice properties. So if we take A and B, where A comes from the group and B comes from GK minus one, we can do some manipulations and compute lambda of AB and lambda of BA. So for lambda of AB, by definition, this is the integral that I've written out in the first line. Then we replace X by B inverse X. And then because B is in GK minus one, we can pull out lambda and then uh, use the definition of lambda of A. And then similar thing happens if we try to evaluate lambda of B A. In both cases, we get lambda of B times lambda of A. So we have some kind of almost homomorphism property, but depending on the order, it maybe switches the order of multiplication. And really what we want to use here is just that these two expressions are equal to each other. So if we look at lambda of B times lambda of A, one way of writing this was lambda of BA. Well, BA is AB times the commutator of B with A. And then the commutator is sitting in GK. So we can pull that out of the expression. And then lambda of AB is also lambda of B times lambda of A. So lambda of B times lambda of A is equal to itself times lambda evaluated at the commutator. And at least lambda of B is sitting in the circle because of what we said about extending lambda to a character on GK minus one. And so we can at least say, dividing by lambda B, that lambda of A times one minus lambda at this commutator is equal to zero. Okay, so what we're now gonna do is another connectedness reduction to show that lambda evaluated at this commutator is zero. And the reason we care about lambda at this commutator is that every element of GK is a commutator well, is in the commutator subgroup generated by G and GK minus one. So GK is generated by elements of this form commutator B with A. So if we can show that all of those generators, that lambda is equal to one on all of those generators, then that means that lambda, the character that we started with on GK is just the trivial character. So by doing this extension to GK minus one, we were able to compute lambda by looking at some commutators and we have now this nice expression. So how does this go? Lambda is a continuous function and lambda of one is equal to one. So this means that For any A in some neighborhood of one, we have to have lambda of this commutator equal to one. So maybe the, the more direct thing to say would be that lambda of A is away from zero in some neighborhood of one, which means that the other expression that we're multiplying by to get zero has to be equal to zero. Okay. But we've assumed that G is connected. And if we look at the commutator B with some product, we can split this up as a product of commutators. And so this is going to allow us to say 
that lambda at any commutator of b with a is equal to one because we've gotten we've gotten it equal to one on some neighborhood and then this neighborhood generates everything but now these commutators b a generate the entire group g sub k so lambda has to be equal to one on all of gk okay and so where did lambda come from it was this eigenvalue associated with the action of gk on the function f and so what we've shown is that eigenvalue is equal to one so f is gk invariant just from assuming that f was t invariant but we also assumed that xk is ergodic so if we have an invariant function it has to be constant and that ends the proof Okay, so there's maybe a lot to digest here. But basically the idea was we took an invariant function for the action of t, and we assumed that one level down we had ergodicity. We then used some additional action of an abelian group coming from the lower central series to be able to uh, treat this function that's t invariant as an eigenfunction for this other group action. And then combining these two actions together because they commute and using some ergodicity properties, we were able to extend this character one level up and from that conclude that it had to be equal to one from which it follows that f is itself a constant function. So I think this is a pretty clever argument. But what it did was say that words reduce uniform distribution properties in a nil manifold to this abelianization where we can actually reasonably say yes or no, we have equidistribution. Okay, so are there any questions on the Green's theorem or anything you want to see back up in the proof? I mean, if you could just wait one moment, I am uh, slightly confused by, oh. Oh, by the uh, claim about commutators, even though it looks like something basic. So I just wanted to do the calculations and mm. yeah I so you're saying G is connected and then the commutator of B comma a1 times a2 is equal to the commutator of B comma a1 times the commutator of B comma a2 is that Am I reading that correctly? Mm -hmm. I possibly I've written something in the wrong order, maybe. I mean, I'm multiplying those two commutators on the right hand side, and the Bs are not canceling. So the right hand side has four Bs, and the left hand side has two Bs. Um, maybe this uses something about nil potence, and is B a uh, in like gk minus one or something yes b is in gk minus one okay so maybe i could work out the rest of it with that extra detail later right. that would explain why i was confused at the beginning i'm good for now thank you okay are there other questions uh let's see so 
I owe you a proof of the lemma that ergodicity and unique ergodicity are the same. I also want to maybe show you some polynomial versions. Uh, does anyone have a preference for which I do? Or I could take maybe an extra five minutes and do both. Take the extra five minutes. OK. Yep. Yeah, I don't have anywhere to be, so. Yeah, so the lemma is not that long, the proof. So I want to show that a nil system is ergodic if and only if it's uniquely ergodic. Uh, and this is a nice proof due to Furstenberg, just looking at the set of generic points. So we take a nil system, and we're going to look at the set of generic points for the Haar measure. So we're assuming that our nil system is ergodic. That means that the set of generic points has to have measure one. And now we're going to do actually a similar trick to what happened in that last theorem and use uh, this commuting action coming from GK. So we'll take the projection to XK and call that set B. And then because elements of GK commute with the element we're translating by, GK has to preserve all of the generic points. Right, so we have a generic point for the, the translation by G. If we apply, if we multiply by some element from GK, maybe I'll write this out. So we're thinking about, well, generic points has to do with an orbit of something like this. If we multiply by something in GK, that's the same as g to the n gkx. And this is going to tell us that gk preserves the generic points. And that means then that if we, so we project it down to xk, if we lift that set back up, we get exactly a. We don't get anything else. And so now we assume we have some other ergodic measure. And by the same induction argument from the last proof, we'll assume that we've sort of shown ergodicity and unique ergodicity are equivalent up to uh, nil potency at step k minus 1. So we'll assume that xk is uniquely ergodic, which means that the measure mu prime has to project to the Haar measure when we go down to xk. And what does that mean? So mu prime of the set of generic points is mu prime of the preimage of B. So that's equal to the Haar measure of B. But then mu x also projected down to that. So mu x at the preimage of b has the same measure, but the preimage of b is just a, and that's equal to 1. So from this, it follows that mu prime had to be the Haar measure. So if you have two different ergodic measures, then they should give a full measure to their own set of generic points and measure 0 to the set of generic points for any other measure. But this shows that for any ergodic measure you take, the set of generic points for the Haar measure has measure 1. So everything was just Haar measure. So I think this is a very nice proof. Um, and it shows that nil systems are fairly nice systems to deal with. Showing ergodicity and unique ergodicity are the same. Also, um, you know, I'm still reading this, but I think Andrew asked you a question in the chat. Oh, sorry. Uh, is pi i k? Uh, OK, pi k a, why is this measurable? Um,
That's a good question. Um, so I think I, I would need to, I don't have the details right off the top of my head. Um, I think the fact that generic points commute with the action of GK should help with that. Um, but there is maybe something to check there. So are there other questions on this lemma? So let me briefly discuss some polynomial versions of this and the applications you get. So we're getting this uh, equidistribution results for linear expressions is useful if you want to prove something like convergence of multiple ergodic averages. Um, or potentially to compute them in some very specific situations. Uh, but a lot of the results for linear averages had proofs uh, of some kind before, for a lot of the applications maybe of, of these linear averages, there are ways of proving it without uh, using these equidistribution results. What's really nice, though, is that we can extend these to more general expressions. So here's a theorem of Lehman about polynomial sequences that generalizes the theorem of Leon Green. So by a polynomial sequence, we'll just mean a sequence of this form a1 to the p1 of n multiplied all the way up to a r to the p r of n, where the a's are elements of the nilpotent group and p's are integer valued polynomials. And Lehman showed that if you take any polynomial sequence in a nil manifold, then we have the same kind of result that uh, polynomial orbits equidistribute in their orbit closure. And we can reduce the equidistribution result from the nil manifold to the abelianization. And the additional piece of information that makes this very useful is that polynomials behave nicely with the van der Korpert trick. And so you can show that polynomial averages of this form are controlled by some nil factor that depends on your family of polynomials. So as I said earlier, this parameter r could be very large if you have high degree polynomials but it's, preserved, it's controlled by some nil factor. And that's enough to prove all sorts of things because we can describe equidistribution of polynomial orbits in nil manifolds using Lehman's theorem. And so some applications of this that are really great are I've just given on this page. So there's the theorem of Bergelson, Lehman, and Lacine that gives necessary and sufficient conditions for polynomial similarity theorem. Uh, maybe I'll just sort of zoom out and try to. So I think probably some combination of the, some of these theorems are maybe familiar. So using Lehman's understanding of equidistribution of polynomial orbits, you can tell exactly when uh, polynomial summary theorem holds. It's this intersectivity property. Um, and then Francis Kanakis and Krah also prove some nice results for the case that we have independent polynomials, meaning that any uh, rational combination is non-constant. And so they showed by reducing, by looking at these nil systems, that for totally ergodic systems, multiple ergodic averages for independent polynomial families converge to the correct limit. And that 
also gives you a uh, Kinchin type recurrence result that for independent jointly intersective polynomials, you can get uh, syndetically many n where you have large intersections. So all of these results, at least one of the key tools is reducing to nil systems and then applying equidistribution results of Leibman to understand uh, some multiple ergodic averages. Okay, and there are extensions of all these things to more general sequences where van der Korpert is useful to uh, sequences involving prime numbers. It's sort of endless what you can do with trying to extend, generalize these results. But um, I think this gives a useful sampling of some results about nil systems that are very practical to use. Um, and so I'll end here and see if there are questions. Um, something general. Uh, I don't remember how they proved the, the very last theorem that you wrote. I do remember that they are doing some algebra and uh, and also they are using the the previous result about the convergence to the right limit. But um, do we have something general when you have, say, uh, convergence to the right limit for uh, total ergodic uh, systems to, to get to get the, the the very last result to get correct uh, uh, to, to get Kinchin type results? So what you you need to show something that's slightly stronger. Um, so there's a, there's a sequence of two papers from Francis Connex and Krona. Mm -hmm. The first, they show this. Yes, uh, yes. Middle the, the first result that you wrote, yes. Right. So the what they do in the paper where they prove this large intersections results is first prove something a little bit stronger, which is that the rational Kronecker factor is characteristic. Yes, yes. And then from there, it's not so bad. So this is where they actually don't prove it for jointly intersected families. Uh, they prove it for polynomials with zero constant term, mm -hmm. but the proof works. So you know that rational Kronecker factor is characteristic. You can approximate it by a particular finite group rotation. And then um, so that the independence allows you to do this approximation by a finite group rotation and then jointly intersective allows you to uh, like kill the entire finite group rotation. And so you get the correct limit. And that's where the, the mu of a to the k plus one comes from. So I, I maybe cheated a little bit, but that's the idea. No, no, I understand. Um, to me, it would be very interesting to see uh, Assuming that you have a correct the expected limit in the total ergodicity case, yeah. What additional assumptions you need to have in order to get uh, the very last result that you are writing? Um, maybe also Andrea will have something to say in that one because I know that all of us are in the same business. But uh, yeah, since why am I saying this for maybe for the younger people too? Uh, if uh, Ethan knew some result for uh, for ergodic systems, then by having a single T using the ergodic decomposition, you would have the expected limit, whatever this thing is, uh, for uh, for a general system. And then by showing when you have polynomials, you expect the uh, nil factor to be the characteristic factor. You will be able to to get the, the very last result that he wrote. Uh, so the question is, uh, what more do you need when you have uh, a, a convergence to the expected limit in a total ergodic system in order to get to the very last result? So, and, and this is not 100% clear to me. 
Yeah, so one paper that might be good to look at for that question is there's a paper from Francis Kinakis uh, called, I know three polynomials is in the title. title. I don't know. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, the one that Andreu sent in the chat. Yes, yes. Oh, is that what? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So there he shows something. Uh, I don't remember the name. He, he gives some name to certain families of polynomials and shows that if something holds for totally ergodic systems, like if you have a characteristic factor for totally ergodic systems, then it's also the characteristic factor for ergodic systems. Mm -hmm. okay. um, but th there are some conditions on the polynomials to check. But that, that would be a good place to look for maybe approaching an answer to that question. And again, it's not only the, the characteristic factor, which is the problem, because again, by Fragiki Nike, she has a very, very general result about uh, even um, variable polynomials, which have uh, uh, the leading coefficient is independent of uh, n. So it, it's not variable, but, but, but the, the result is yeah. very, very general. The nil factor is characteristic. So this is not the main issue. But, but anyways, thank you for the answer. So we can thank Ethan again, Sohel, and you can kill the recording. Thank you, Ethan. Thank you, Ethan.